On November 9, 1971, devout Lutheran John Emil List murdered his entire family. John List shot his wife, three children, and elderly mother to death in their home. A month passed before anyone discovered the bodies, and by that time, John List had disappeared. He wouldn't be found for 17 years. This is the story of the John List murders. John Emil List was born in Bay City, Michigan on September 17, 1925, to German-American parents John Frederick List and Alma Barbara List. John List grew up an only child in a strict, highly religious household. His father, John Frederick, was a stern, devout Lutheran who taught Sunday school. Lumber mills supported Bay City. John Frederick detested the secular culture that dominated the sawmills and Bay City at large. By the turn of the century in 1901, the elder List accrued enough wealth from working at a general store to purchase a 56-acre plot of farmland for the cost of $900. Once the lumber industry left the city and the farming and real estate industries arrived, the plot would end up worth a hefty fortune. John List was raised in a substantial Victorian estate on Winona Avenue. Due to penny pinching and not from financial need, John Frederick rented the second floor of the house to tenants. Throughout his childhood, young John would sleep on the couch and clean up after himself. The boy grew up with the understanding that he was not allowed to leave a trace of himself. A school classmate would later say of List, he was there, but always ended up in the background. John Frederick was comfortably into his 60s by the time his son was born, and he had little interest in raising his son, whom he referred to as the boy. Any instruction given to the boy was done so through his wife Alma, leaving little interaction between father and son. The boy was expected to excel in school, follow the church, and to be only seen and heard when necessary. Outside of that, John Frederick left the raising of his son to Alma. Where John List's father was cold, his mother, in sharp contrast, was by all accounts warm and kind. Indeed, she is overbearingly protective of the young John List. John and his mother would often stay inside and read the Bible when the neighborhood children were outside playing. There were children she didn't approve of for John, recalled Laura Werner, a tenant and lifelong friend of Alma's. He was smothered by his mother's protectiveness. High school gave John List his first taste of independence, much to his mother's dismay, as it required bus trips out of his neighborhood and into downtown. At Bay City Central High School, John made very little of an impression on his classmates. 28 years later, once he became the most famous member of his graduating class, Stunned classmates only vaguely recall the tall, bookish, devoutly religious boy. By the time John graduated high school in June of 1943, half of the boys in his senior class had opted for early graduation in order to join the army in World War II. John too desired to drop out early to enlist, but his mother, characteristically protective, refused. Soon after graduation, he defied his mother's wishes and enlisted in the service. As the war entered its final stages, the immediate demand for ground troops had abated. The eager Private John List would spend his first year with the Army in Louisiana. In letters home, he made it very clear that Army life, with its unflexible rules similar to that of his home, suited him quite well. As World War II waned, John List suffered through the infantry training in the swamps of Louisiana. Then, on August 30th, 1944, the base chaplain called John to inform him that his father, who had been ill for the past year, had passed away. The funeral for John Frederick was held in the family's front parlor. A neighbor recalled with a chill that at the funeral, John showed no sign of grief. It was as if nothing had happened. In February of 1945, John was finally shipped overseas to Europe, where Allied forces were pressing their final assaults into Germany. He took part in a final stage infantry campaign across the German border, where he claimed his unit took on German artillery fire. On the morning of April 11, 1945, he was part of an infantry patrol that was captured by German troops as prisoners of war. The Germans, however, evidently recognizing that the war was already lost, changed their minds and gave themselves up to the Americans later that afternoon. With the German surrender imminent, 
John, along with thousands of other soldiers, found themselves bound to Japan. Shortly after their arrival, the war with Japan ended after the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. On April 22, 1946, eight months after the Japanese surrender and after a few months of post-work busywork in the Philippines, Private First Class John List returned home to his widowed mother in Bay City, Michigan. Among his proudly displayed souvenirs from the war was a pistol, an Australian Steyr that he had purchased in 1944 and used to qualify for an Army Sharpshooter's badge. He wouldn't fire that pistol again for another 27 years. Home from the war and eager to jumpstart a career, John and his mother made arrangements for him to go to college. Campus life in America at the time was booming, as thousands of soldiers flooded into college campuses on the GI Bill. Alma encouraged her son to study accounting, and the two of them landed on the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, 100 miles south of Bay City. At least once a month, Alma visited John on the campus for the weekend, staying at a rooming house recommended by the campus's Lutheran organization. On those weekends, they spent all their hours together, going out for dinner, attending church services, and reading and discussing the Bible. In June of 1950, John graduated with a bachelor's degree. Shortly after, he was awarded his MBA and became a certified public accountant. In November of 1950, as the Korean War escalated, John was recalled into active military service. He would not see action again, however, as he was stationed at the large army base in Fort Eustis, Virginia. It was here that John began to occasionally date women, and would meet a woman that would shortly become his wife. One evening, when John and his friend, Ted, went out bowling, Ted started flirting with two women at the bowling alley, one of whom was Helen Morris. Helen had reluctantly gone out that night on the behest of her sister, Jean Seifert. Just the day prior, Helen had laid her late husband, Marvin Taylor, to rest. Marvin was a soldier in the United States military and was killed in the Korean War, leaving behind a 26-year-old Helen and their 9-year-old daughter, Brenda. Helen's sister Jean took her out bowling to try and take her mind off things. John's friend Ted was set on flirting with Helen, and shortly after conversing, had set a date. The two went out a few times before Ted revealed to Helen that he was married. Helen, not approving of such infidelity, dumped him straight away. Once John found this out, he began his courtship. Helen had married her first husband, Marvin, when she was 16 years old, dropping out of high school to do so. The marriage would be scarred towards the end, before the tragedy of Marvin's death. In 1947, Helen and their daughter Brenda traveled to Korea to live with Marvin where he was stationed. While there, Marvin caught several sexually transmitted diseases and passed them on to Helen. Helen became so seriously ill that she had to be airlifted to the United States to recover. Helen would never see her husband again, as he would be killed in action months later. For reasons that remain unclear, Helen was not treated for syphilis that she contracted from Marvin. She would suffer from the effects of the disease for the rest of her life. Not knowing anything other than married life for the entirety of her adulthood, she was anxious to find a new husband and settled on John List. Most would describe Private John List as a quiet, meek, and timid man. Helen, on the other hand, was anything but. John quickly started spending most of his weekly pay in his efforts to woo the boisterous and often demanding Helen, who was quickly pressuring him into marriage. John, however, was uncertain, especially after consulting with his mother over the phone. Helen sensed John's wavering uncertainty and announced only weeks into dating that she was pregnant. Not seeing any other options, John List proposed marriage. On December 1st, 1951, less than two months after they had met at the bowling alley, John and Helen List were wed. Before the wedding, John's only condition was that Helen convert into the Lutheran Church. Shortly after the wedding, Helen revealed that she was wrong about the pregnancy and that they were not having a baby. John, surprisingly to his peers, seemed unfazed by this manipulation and rather just seemed happy to be married. John was discharged from the army in April of 1952 and then moved with his new wife Helen and nine-year-old Brenda back to his home state of Michigan, where John returned to work as an accountant. The war was behind him, and now, with a new family and new job in hand, the American dream seemed almost to be in the grasp of John List. John and Helen's first child, Patricia Marie, later known as Pat by her friends, was born on January 8, 1955, in a Detroit, Michigan hospital. Brenda, now 13, was overjoyed to have a new baby in the house. 
while John and Helen were happily into their marriage and life in Detroit. It was at this time that a new job opportunity arrived for John, and the family packed and moved to Kalamazoo, Michigan. Hired in the cost division of the Sutherland Paper Company, John was paid $7,200 a year, a solid salary for a young family man at the time. Helen became pregnant again shortly after their move to Kalamazoo, and on October 21, 1956, the couple's second child, John Frederick, named after John's own father, was born. One of the first things John Liss did upon his family's move to Kalamazoo was enroll his family in the local Lutheran church, intent on raising his children under the same devout faith that he was raised under. Due to his skills as an accountant, List was elected as a treasurer of the parish, a position his father once too had held. He called his mother Alma proudly, letting her know he was keeping the family tradition alive. Helen, however, was not as keen as John on attending church services and functions. She would rather spend her Sundays cooking for her family and reading. This began to infuriate John, but he would never express his emotions. As an adult, John was a meek and timid man. Instead, John would shuffle around the house, silently getting the children ready, and without a word, he would leave for church. He couldn't understand why his wife would humiliate him like this, with everyone seeing that she didn't have the decency to come to services. On the occasions that Helen would argue with John, he would never fight back. He would simply stay silent and sulk around the house. Slowly, their relationship was beginning to erode. On August 26, 1958, the couple's last child, Frederick Michael, was born. Helen suffered from postpartum depression after the birth of their youngest son and began drinking regularly, along with taking prescription tranquilizers given to her by a psychiatrist. She would become dependent on both alcohol and the medication for the rest of her life. Soon, John would start coming home to find Helen asleep on the couch with a glass of scotch in hand, the children unfed, and their diapers unchanged. Instead of voicing concern for his wife or even frustration, John held it in. Helen rarely began leaving the house and was seldom seen by their neighbors. Seemingly overwhelmed with the children and the housework, Helen would frequently leave messages to John at his office, such as, Your wife called and said your son had soiled his pants. If you want them changed, come home and do it. And John would do just that. Brenda would later recall, Mom was really boozing it up back then, saying she could never forget Marvin and that John could never live up to him. Brenda, now a teenager, was fed up with playing intermediary between her mother and stepfather. This affected Brenda so deeply that on the day she turned 18, she got her driver's license, married her boyfriend, and moved out of the house. In October of 1959, John was suddenly let go from his job at the Sutherland Paper Company, a pattern that would follow him for the rest of his life. John's meek and timid nature also translated to his work life. While he would always make a good impression at first with his polite manners, it would soon become clear to employers that John lacked initiative and did not have the skills necessary in order to succeed in a business environment. John sent out over a hundred resumes in response to classified ads, one of which was to the Xerox Corporation in Rochester, New York. Xerox would eventually hire List on a salary of $25,000 a year. The family then moved from Kalamazoo to Rochester, New York. During their life in Rochester, Helen and John would begin living outside their means, going into debt by buying furniture and appliances for their new home on credit. In just a few years, John was again let go from his job. Now, in 1965, at 40 years old, John List once again focused himself on sending out hundreds of resumes across the country. His persistence once again paid off, and John accepted a position of Vice President and Comptroller at the First National Bank of Jersey City, New Jersey. Moving once again, John and Helen sent their sights on a large old Victorian house. The estate was underpriced due to its age and being badly in need of repairs. That didn't stop John, however, from wanting to put a down payment down on the house, a down payment that he could only afford if he were to borrow it from his mother, Alma. Alma had a large nest egg of money after the sale of her late husband's land and business, and she agreed to supply the money for the down payment on the condition that she would live on the house's top floor apartment. John and Helen agreed, and so, at the age of 79, Alma List, who had never lived more than 10 miles away from her birthplace, would spend the last years of her life on the third floor of a decrepit, decaying mansion in Westfield, New Jersey. John enrolled the family in the local Lutheran church and was proud to be seen with his mother and three children, 
but Helen insisted that she not be a member of the church congregation. Mortified, John told his wife he complied, but in reality never took her name off the register. John's job as a bank vice president lasted one year. The bank, like all employers before them, quickly realized that the mild-mannered List was not the kind of personality suited for the business position. John List, fired once again, was humiliated. He could not bring himself to tell anyone what had happened. Instead, each morning, John would leave the house with a briefcase and newspaper in hand. He would then drive to a train station where he would sit and read. Sometimes, if the weather was nice, he'd take a walk in a park nearby. Then, at 5 p.m., after business hours, he would drive back home. John List did this every workday for six months. While John was meek and timid when it came to adults, he would assert his dominance towards children. Like his father before him, John List was extremely strict. He drilled into his children his religious teachings and made strict schedules that the children had to follow. John had to approve any friends the children had and always had to know where his children were at all times. If they disappointed him, he would make his disdain known verbally by yelling and screaming. On more than one occasion, List was heard calling his daughter Patricia a slut for the way she dressed. In 1967, John found work at the American Photographic Company in New York City, but again was let go within a year of his hiring. To keep his household afloat, he would secretly withdraw money from his mother's bank account, using the power of attorney that she had given him years earlier. John believed he would be able to pay this money back eventually, but sooner than he realized, the entire account was drained. Alma, now deep into her 70s, was penniless. It was at this time that Helen was hospitalized. She was diagnosed with general paresis, a fatal disease. Doctor, and even Helen's sister Jean, recommended that Helen be institutionalized in a hospital, but John refused. Now, with the added financial burden of Helen's illness, John took out a loan for $4,000, and later, a second mortgage on the house for $7,000. Not able to find a new job, John attempted to work out of his house selling mutual funds. His sales, however, would end up seldom and in short supply. Helen now spent most of her days bedridden. The young boys, John Frederick, 15, and Fred, at 13, believed their mother would get better and simply needed rest. Pat, however, was old enough to realize the truth. Her mother was dying. Pat became a teenager right at the height of the counterculture movement, an influence that John was horrified to see on his daughter. During the last eight months of her life, Pat fell in love with the theater. She was reluctant to go to a workshop at first, but at the behest of a friend, she quickly discovered her passion. The school's theater program was run by a man named Ed Iliano, a freelance voice and drama teacher. Ed was in his early 40s at the time and was very passionate about community theater. He was amazed how Pat List had plunged right in and how it seemed to benefit her. In the drama group, Pat, for the first time, had found direction in her life. John, however, detested his daughter's newfound passion fearing that her desire to become an actor would lead her away from the church and a Christian life. John's walls were closing in. Their debt was rising, and by October of 1971, John had only made $5,000 for the entire year. On top of that, the secular world was starting to encroach on his family. There was no way out. On Friday, November 5th, John Wiss stood at the kitchen table and told one of the boys to get his sister and brother. When Pat, John, and Fred sat at the table, John told the children that they would die, soon, and asked them if they would prefer to be buried or cremated. The children sat there and shocked. One of the boys timidly said buried, and the others followed. John stood up and calmly walked out of the room, shutting the door to his office. That same night, Pat attended a drama group rehearsal of a streetcar named Desire. Her eyes were red from crying. Worried, her teacher, Ed Iliano, offered to drive her home. Hearing her sobbing now in the car, he asked her what was the matter. Mr. Iliano, my father is going to kill me, my brothers too. He said that, Mr. Iliano. If he ever tells you he's going to take the family out on a trip for a couple weeks, that's it. That's how he's going to do it. Iliano tried to comfort the young girl, who he had developed a special relationship with. He told her that no one would kill her and he would be there to protect her. 
After some time, Pat stopped crying, and Ileano drove her home. Early in the morning of November 9th, 1971, John opened his budget book for the first and last time. His money was gone. His mother's money was all gone. It was hopeless. All his prayers and pleas to God had led him to this. He closed his book and put it aside on the desk by his Bible. John packed a briefcase and a small suitcase, took a deep breath, and waited. He stood by the curtain as he watched Pat get picked up by a friend to go to school, and shortly after the two boys be picked up for their carpool by a neighbor. With the children now out of the house, John walked over to a file cabinet labeled Guns and Ammo. Inside were two pistols, his father's pistol, and the 1912 Steyer John had brought back from World War II. At 8.30 in the morning, the milkman parked behind the house to make his scheduled delivery for the week. He unlocked the back door and walked across the kitchen to find a note from John saying to stop deliveries until further notice because the family was going on vacation. At the window, John watched until the truck turned out of the house and onto the street. Helen came downstairs 10 minutes later to make herself tea for the morning. In the kitchen, the kettle whistled and Helen took it off the flame. John walked behind her, silent, with the styre in his right hand. He raised the pistol just inches from Helen's head. Helen, sensing movement, turned her head to see her husband, right as he fired the gun. The bullet hit Helen in the face as she fell to the ground. She laid motionless, blood pooling across the floor. Quickly, John ran up the back stairs to the third floor and barged into his mother's apartment. He found her in the kitchen holding a plate with butter, waiting by the toaster. Alma looked startled and turned to John asking what the noise downstairs was. John raised his gun and shot her once above the left eye at point-blank range. Alma's body flew off the ground and onto the kitchen floor. John then tried to move his mother's body, but due to her size and weight, he struggled. He found a carpet and dragged her body onto it and used the carpet to pull her into the hallway. He then went into the kitchen and dragged Helen's body to the other side of the house into the ballroom. John retrieved sleeping bags and arranged Helen's body into one of them. He laid the other bags on the ballroom's floor. John put a kitchen towel over Helen's face and then went to the bathroom to wash the blood from his hands and body. John then became overcome with nausea and started vomiting. John then washed his face, changed into a suit and tie, combed his hair neatly, and went back downstairs. The first phase of John's plan had gone according to plan. John then made a call to cancel an appointment for his home insurance company that was scheduled for that day, leaving a message saying his mother-in-law was very ill and he was taking his entire family to North Carolina to see her. Next, John wrote letters addressed to the children's schools. To Westfield High School. Our daughter Patricia is a student in the 11th grade at Westfield High School. She will be out for a few days since we had to make an emergency trip to North Carolina. We left after the school was closed, so I'm sending this to you to explain her absence. John List, 431 Hillside Avenue. With this task complete, John had some time before the next phase of the plan and decided to rake the leaves outside one last time. When he came back inside, he made himself a sandwich. The first deviation from the murder plan came at noon when Patty called saying she wasn't feeling well and wanted to come home after school instead of going to work. John, annoyed, got in the car and drove to Westfield High to pick up Patty. They rode home together in silence. John parked the car and hurried to be the first person inside. Patty took her books from the back seat and came in through the laundry room to the kitchen. She never saw John waiting in the corner behind the door. John shot his daughter at close range in the back of the head. When she lay still on the ground, John dragged her across the hall into the ballroom, putting her corpse onto the sleeping bags beside her mother's body. At 1 p.m., John again washed himself and changed his clothes, and then left the house for the rest of the plan. He first drove to a drive-in bank branch and cashed a check for $85. He then went to the post office and mailed a letter addressed to himself, in which contained a key. He then filmed out a form at the post office, asking them to hold the family's mail for the next 30 days. From the post office, he went back to the bank and at a separate window, cashed a second check for 
Then he drove three blocks of the way to the main offices of the Suburban Trust Bank, which held his mother's safety deposit box, which contained savings bonds and jewelry. John calmly cashed each savings bond, a total of just over $2,000. He signed out of the vault at 1.57 p.m. and then headed back to the home on Hillside Avenue, where three members of his family lay dead. Fred arrived at his after-school job at 3 p.m. and was dismayed when he found that Patty had called in sick. Fred immediately was concerned and called home demanding to know what had happened to Patty. John, once again, made another unplanned trip, this time to pick up Fred, who had told his employers he needed to get home. Just as he had done with Patty, John made sure he was first inside of the house. Fred died with a single gunshot wound to the head. Once again, John dragged the body onto a sleeping bag in the ballroom, this time next to his sister. November 9th was an unexpectedly cold day, and therefore, young John Frederick's soccer practice had been canceled. His father was surprised to see the boy walking up the driveway, swinging his lunchbox at around 4 p.m. John was scrambled to get into position behind the kitchen door, which John Frederick may have heard as he came into the kitchen cautious. John Frederick saw his father raise the gun at him. He tried to dodge, the bullet missing his head and hitting him in the back. John shot the boy again, but again, John Frederick would not die. Liz started firing wildly, the boy crawling across the floor, trying desperately to get to safety. His father fired the gun again, again, and again until the styre clicked empty. Finally, the boy stopped moving. John dragged his 15-year-old son to the ballroom, putting the boy's body on the sleeping bags next to his brother. John pulled at all the sleeping bags until the bodies were arranged neatly. He bent down and moved Helen's arm so it rested on Fred's shoulder. The bodies were arranged in the form of a cross. In the dimming light of day, John List knelt on the bedroom to say a final prayer in the names of Alma, Helen, Patricia, John, and Frederick List. At 5 p.m., the doorbell rang. John List froze in panic. Carefully, and silently, John went down to the parlor and peered through the curtains. It was the mailman. John stood silently as the letter and key that John had mailed to himself earlier that day was delivered. He was shocked at the post office's efficiency, as he expected the letter to arrive later in the week. He let the envelope lay on the floor. At 7 p.m., John called his pastor. Reverend Eugene Raywinkle at the Redeemer Evangelical Lutheran Church. John told Pastor Raywinkle that his family was already on a plane for North Carolina and that he would be joining them soon. He informed Raywinkle reluctantly that he would not be able to teach Sunday school for at least a week. The pastor told him not to worry and that he would keep the List family in his prayers. The last call John made that night was to Ed Iliano. Iliano's assistant, Barbara Sheridan, answered the phone. John told Barbara that Patty would be missing theater workshops and rehearsals for a while since they would be in North Carolina visiting his wife's sick mother. For the rest of the night, John List wrote letters. The first letter was to his mother-in-law, Ava Morris, who in reality was indeed quite ill. Mrs. Morris, by now, you no doubt know what has happened to Helen and the children. I'm very sorry that it had to happen, but because of a number of reasons, I couldn't see any other solution. I just couldn't support them anymore, and I didn't want them to go into poverty. Also, at this time, I knew that they were all Christians. I couldn't be sure of that in the future as the children grow up. Pastor Raymond Cole may add a few more thoughts. With my sincere sympathy, John E. List. To Helen's sister, Jean Seifert, John wrote, Mrs. Jean Seifert, by now you have heard what happened to Helen and the children. I'm sorry that it had to go that way, but when I couldn't support them, I couldn't let them go on welfare, etc. Please accept my sincere sympathy, John. To Alma's sister, he wrote, Mrs. Lydia Meyer, by now you know what has happened to mother and the rest of the family. For a number of reasons, this was the only solution that I could see for the family. And to save mother untold anguish over the result, I felt it best that she be relieved from this veil of tears. 
Please accept my sincere condolences. John. Next, John wrote a letter to Burton Goldstein at State Mutual, the company he had been selling insurance for from his home. Hello, Bert. I'm sorry that it all had to end this way, but with so little income, I just couldn't go on keeping the family together, and I didn't want them to experience poverty. I want to thank you for everything that you did for me. You treated me better than any associate I've ever dealt with, and I'm sorry that I have to repay you in this way. The files are marked so they can be turned over to you. Best wishes, John. John placed each letter in an unsealed envelope. He placed the envelope into a large manila folder. He labeled the folder for Pastor E. A. Raymingle of Redeemer Lutheran Church. Now, John only had one more letter to write, his confession. He wrote the date, November 9th, 1971. Dear Pastor Raymingle, I'm very sorry to add this additional burden to your work. I know that what I have done is wrong from all that I have been taught, and that any reasons I might give will not make it right. But you are the one person I know that, while not condoning this, you will at least partially understand why I felt I had to do this. 1. I wasn't earning anywhere near enough to support us. Everything I tried seemed to fall to pieces. True, we could have gone bankrupt and maybe gone on welfare. 2. But that brings me to my next point. Knowing the type of location that one would have to live in, plus the environment for the children, plus the effect of them knowing they were on welfare, was just more than I thought they could and should endure. I know that they were willing to have cut back, but this evolved a lot more than that. 3. With Pat being so determined to get into acting, I was also fearful as to what this might do to her continuing to be a Christian. I'm sure that it wouldn't have helped. 4. Also, with Helen not going to church, I knew that this would harm the children eventually in their attendance. I had continued to hope that she would begin to come to church soon, but when I mentioned to her that Mr. Jetsy wanted to pay her an elder's call, she just blew up and stated that she would want her name taken off the church rolls. Again, this could only have given an adverse result for the children's continued attendance. So, that is the sum of it. If any one of these had been the condition, we might have pulled through, but this was just too much. At least I'm certain that all have gone to heaven now. If things had gone on, who knows if that would have been the case. Of course, Mother got involved because doing what I did to my family would have been a tremendous shock to her at this age. Therefore, knowing she is also a Christian, I felt it best that she be relieved of the troubles of this world that would have hit her. After it was all over, I said some prayers for them all, from the hymn book. That was the least I could do. Now for the final arrangements. Helen and the children have all agreed that they are preferred to be cremated. Please see to it that the costs are kept low. For Mother, she has a plot at the Frankenmuth Church Cemetery. Please contact Mr. Herman Schellis. He's married to a niece of Mother's and knows what arrangements are to be made. She always wanted Reverend Herman Zindler of Bay City to preach the sermon, but he is not well. I'm also leaving some letters in your care. Please send them on and add whatever comments you think appropriate. The relations are as follows. Miss Lydia Meyer, mother's sister, Mrs. Eva Morris, Helen's mother, Jean Seifert, Helen's sister. Also, I don't know what will happen to the books and other personal things, but to the extent possible, I'd like for them to be distributed as you see fit. Some books might go to the school or church library. Originally, I had planned this for November 1st, All Saint Days, but travel arrangements were delayed. I thought it would be an appropriate day for them to get to heaven. As for me, please let me be dropped from congregation roles. I leave myself in the hand of God's justice and mercy. I don't doubt that he is able to help us, but apparently he saw fit not to answer my prayers the way I hoped that they would have been answered. This makes me think that perhaps it was for the best as far as the children's souls are concerned. I know that many will only look at the additional years they could have lived, but if finally they were no longer Christians, what would have been gained? Also, I'm sure many will say, how could anyone do such a horrible thing? My only answer is, it isn't easy and was only done after much thought. Pastor, Mrs. Morris may be reached at 802 Pleasant Hill Drive, Elkin, home of her sister. One more thing. I know it may have been cowardly to always have shot from behind, but I didn't want any of them to know even at the last second that I had to do this for them. John got hurt more because he seemed to struggle longer. The rest were immediately put out of pain. John probably didn't consciously feel anything either. 
The murderer then crossed out the word probably and continued. Please remember me in your prayers. I will need them whether or not the government does its duty as it sees it. I am only concerned with making my peace with God, and of this I am sure because of Christ's dying even for me. P.S. Mother is in the hallway in the attic, third floor. She was, she was too heavy to move. John. It should be noted that in this confession, John lied in an effort to save face. Autopsies would later reveal that of the five, only Patty was shot in the back of the head. For all the others, the last image they saw in life was that of John List aiming a pistol at their heads. John put the confession letter in the manila envelope. He put his two pistols and ammunition into the bottom right-hand drawer of his file cabinet. He taped a note to it, guns and ammo. On the drawer above, he put in the manila envelope and taped a note saying, to Pastor Ray Winkle, Burton Goldstein, and administrators. John then locked the drawer shut. John left one final note taped to the top of his desk. To the finder, one, please contact the proper authorities. Two, the key to this desk is in an envelope addressed to myself. Three, the keys to the files are in the desk. Once more, John fell to his knees and prayed. Afterwards, he went to the kitchen and made himself dinner. He washed the dishes and left them to dry. Then he went to the billiard room and slept for the night. Before dawn, John awoke. John turned the thermostat in the house down to 50 degrees, cold enough to make the fuel last for the lights as long as possible and also to slow decomposition of the bodies. John went around the house, turning all the lights on in every room except the ballroom where the bodies lay. He placed three plastic bags he had filled with bloody towels and newspapers near the kitchen's back door. In the closet in the main hall, a stereo receiver was wired to an intercom system throughout the house. John turned the stereo to WQXR-FM, the classical music station of the New York Times. Orchestral music filled throughout the house. With $2,500 in his wallet, John took his small suitcase and briefcase and left by the back door. He drove from his house to the offices of KMB Associates, where Patty and Fred worked after school. He got out and slept a letter explaining their absences under the front door. John then drove to Kennedy International Airport, following the signs for long-term parking. Once parked, he turned the car off, took the keys out of the ignition, and tucked them under the front seat. Locking the car behind him, John List walked across the parking lot to the terminals and quickly faded into the sea of travelers. He would not be seen again for 17 years. On the evening of November 9th, Ed Iliano drove down Hillside Avenue. He slowly passed by the List House, trying to be inconspicuous. Pat's words rang through his head. He's going to kill me, Mr. Iliano. He told me that. Everything looked still and calm at the List House. Lights were on. Ed drove on home. Days began to pass. No one had heard from the List family for a couple of weeks. Ediliano began driving by the List house almost every night, and on several occasions knocked at the front door and rang the doorbell. It was obvious that no one was home. Members of Patty's drama group also began to worry, as well as school administrators. Mildred Krieger, the school district's attendance officer, went to the house as well to ring the bell, to which no one answered. A week later she returned. Nothing had changed. Ed Iliano called a friend that he had had in the police department, saying he thought there was a problem at the List House. The officer was sympathetic, but told Ed there wasn't much they could do. They couldn't just go into the house. Ed Iliano then called John's church, where Pastor Raymond assured Ed that there was nothing to worry about. On Sunday, December 5th, almost a month after the murder, Ed Iliano drove back to the List House. There were still no signs of activity. Later that night, after sulking through dinner with his wife, Ed decided that he had to get into the house for himself. Ed Iliano parked his car on the street behind 431 Hillside Avenue and casually strode onto the list property. He was determined to have a look inside to assure that everything was okay. Ed walked to the ground level windows near the back of the house and pushed one of the windows open. Slowly, he dropped into the basement of a house, a small flashlight in hand. Later. Prosecutors would discount Ed's story of this night. 
but Adeliano, who died in 2009, insisted what follows is the truth. As Ed told it, he stood motionless in the dark, his heart pounding. He then heard music coming from upstairs. Slowly, Ed made his way up the stairs, the classical music growing louder and louder until it filled the entire first floor. Lights were on everywhere in the house except for the ballroom. He walked into the ballroom and shined his flashlight into the dark. He thought he saw what looked like a bundle of clothes on the floor to the right, and he panned his flashlight over until suddenly he saw a child's face. Horrified, Ed snapped the flashlight off. Timidly, he took a step closer. At his feet, he could make out the gruesome, bloated body of a deceased Helen List. The children's bodies were beside their mothers. Ed, horrified, shouted Pat's name into the empty room, which echoed. He then turned and ran out the back door straight to his car. He does not remember driving the 10 miles home, nor what he told his wife when he entered the door. For the next two nights and days, Ed Eliano lived in a panic. When later asked why he didn't call the police then and there, he said he didn't want to be prosecuted for breaking and entering. On Tuesday, December 7th, Ed returned to the list house, determined to have neighbors notice his presence and to call police to check the house. Earlier that evening at drama practice, some of the boys had been talking about entering the house themselves. Ileano, upon hearing this, said he would take care of it himself. Barbara Sheridan, Ed's assistant, came with him. Ed pulled up to the list house, keeping his headlights on, and slammed the door loudly when he got out. It was 9.45 p.m., and Ed was talking as loudly as he could to attract the attention of the neighbors. One of the neighbors was Shirley Cunnick, who heard Ed's commotion. She had been keeping a close eye on 431 Hillside Avenue and Ed Eliano's car, who she had seen driving by many times. A friend of Alma's, Shirley Cunnick called the police to report her concern and sent her husband, a medical doctor, William Cunnick, to investigate what was going on. Ed Eliano banged on the front door of the list house as sirens started to wail in the distance. Hearing this, he headed back to the car to wait with Barbara, and within a few minutes, a Westfield patrol car pulled into the driveway. Barbara Sheridan introduced themselves and told the officers that, that they were concerned about the house and the family. The two officers, patrolman Charles Holler and George Zelznick, inspected the exterior of the house. Zelznick approached Ed, and after a brief discussion, the two of them decided to enter the house. Upon entering, Zelznick noticed an offensive smell right away. Music was playing loudly. Shaking, Ed led the officer to the ballroom. Zelznick shone his light inside and gasped in horror when it illuminated the bodies. Ed, meanwhile, ran out to the front door, saying that something terrible had happened. Barbara, Patrolman Holler, and Dr. Cunnick hurried inside. Someone turned on the lights. The bodies were badly, badly decomposed. Horrified, Dr. Cunnick, an internal medicine specialist, examined the victims. The doctor identified them as Helen, Patricia, John, and Frederick List. Holler rushed outside to his patrol call and grabbed the radio. At 10.10 p.m., the dispatcher logged a call to the chief of police. Police Chief Moran headed quickly to 431 Hillside Avenue. Upon his arrival, Ediliano suddenly realized and called out, something's missing. The old lady, she lives upstairs. Chief Moran turned to his officers and asked them if they had searched the upstairs, which they responded they did not. Soon, a scream was heard from an officer on the upstairs floor. They had discovered Alma's body. Yet after a thorough search of the house, it was apparent that the only List family member not dead was John. The officer had discovered John's letters, and after forcing open his file cabinet, the confession letter addressed to Pastor Raymonkel at Redeemer Lutheran Church. After reading the letter, Chief Moran called the pastor, who, shocked, was allowed to read the confession letter addressed to him. Finally, after photographs were taken and the crime scene processed, ambulances carried the bodies away. On December 9th, a Port Authority policeman making his routine checks at Kennedy International Airport discovered John List's 1963 Blue Chevrolet Impala. Despite this discovery and all the other physical evidence at the crime scene, law enforcement had no leads. With the car discovered at the airport and John's passport missing from the home, some authorities believed that John could have fled the country. The bodies of Helen, Patricia, John, and Frederick were laid to rest on December 10, 1971. 
By this time, the FBI was working on the case as well, sending flyers and posters with the face and crimes of John List all over the country. No leads ever surfaced. The cold reality was John List had had a month's head start on evading capture, and the trail, if there ever was one, was now long cold. John Emil List, mass murderer, was gone in the wind. In December of 1971, John List was hiding in Denver after taking a train from New York. For $1,500 cash, he was able to buy a mobile home on the outskirts of the city of Denver under the new name of Robert P. Clark. He would stay in a small trailer with its amenities quietly for six months, making little impression. By the second half of 1972, Bob Clark started venturing more and more outside and found work as a cook during the night shift at a Holiday Inn West, cooking hamburgers and other meals for patrons. John worked hard at his job and impressed his boss, Chef Gary Morrison. So much so that when Gary Morrison found a new position in 1974, he took John List with him. Slowly, the newly named Bob Clark was making a life for himself. By 1975, Bob Clark was living in an apartment and found enough solid ground to enroll himself into a new church, St. Paul's Lutheran Church in downtown Denver. By 1976, Bob Clark was able to obtain a driver's license under his new name. Now, Bob Clark was an employee, a church congregant, a taxpayer, and a licensed driver. The transition into a new life had been fully realized. In 1977, for the second time in his life, Bob Clark had fallen in love. Bob met Dolores H. Miller at a local singles social sponsored by Lutheran churches. Dolores was a shy woman in her mid-30s, recently divorced and very religious. Dolores and Bob had a slow courtship. She had no interest in getting married again, but was attracted to Bob's gentle demeanor. He was always sweet to her, almost too sweet, a friend of Dolores would later recall. Bob told Dolores that he was married once before and that his wife had died from cancer. Not wanting to delve into this tragedy, she never pressed him on his past, and soon Bob was once again looking for accounting work. He was hired on as an accountant in 1977. As time went on, Bob and Dolores began to get closer. The two bought a condominium together in Denver in 1981, and by the summer of 1985, after years of pressuring, Dolores had at last agreed to marry Bob. On November 23, 1985, Dolores and Bob were married in a Lutheran church in Reisertown, Maryland, where Dolores' mother had lived. The wedding took place just 20 miles away from where, 34 years prior, John and Helen List were too wed in a Lutheran church. Five months after the wedding, true to form, Bob was let go from his accountant position. Once again, he started his tireless search for another entry-level accounting job. In February of 1987, Bob and Dolores' neighbor and friend, Wanda Flannery, bought an issue of a tabloid called the Weekly World News. This seemingly innocuous purchase would, in fact, become Bob Clark's downfall. In the pages of the tabloid, Wanda stumbled upon an article about a mass murderer who had been on the loose since 1971 after killing his wife, mother, and children. The account of John Emil List came with a picture. Wanda looked at the picture and then, shocked, looked out the window to Bob Clark, who was taking out the trash. Oh my god, Wanda exclaimed. She read the article again and again. Each detail of John Emil List seemed to parallel that of Robert P. Clark. Wanda, who cared about Dolores deeply, walked over to their house next door. Learning that Bob had left the home, Wanda came inside to talk to Dolores and had her read the newspaper article. Dolores, I'm sorry, but isn't that Bob? Wanda asked. Dolores laughed and told her friend, of course not. How could she think such a thing? Wanda felt foolish, but was relieved that her friend didn't seem to be offended. She asked Dolores, though, to show the article to Bob. Dolores said she would. Later, when Wanda asked Dolores if she had shown Bob the magazine, Dolores revealed that she had thrown the magazine away, not wanting to upset her husband. With no evidence in hand, Wanda decided that she would have to let her suspicions go. It must have been a strange, strange coincidence. In November of 1987, Bob Clark had finally again found work for himself, accepting an accounting position in Richmond, Virginia at the firm of Madrea, Joyner, Kirkham, and Woody. Soon, the Clarks left Denver and moved into a new home. The two also enrolled in the Lutheran Church of Our Savior in Richmond. Bob slowly and comfortably settled into his new role at the firm, 
as Dolores joined the church's Bible study, quickly making friends. The Clarks quickly adjusted to their new home and comfortable life in Richmond, Virginia. In 1988, the Fox Broadcasting Corporation had begun airing a new television program, America's Most Wanted. Hosted by John Walsh, the program showcased dramatizations of serious crimes where perpetrators were still at large, followed by information about the fugitives, as well as actual photographs of the criminals. The show then prompted viewers to call into a tip line if they had any information about the fugitives shown. The program was an instant rating success, with each episode prompting, on average, 6,000 phone calls of tips. FBI agent Frank Marcana, who had inherited the John List case, was dead set on getting John List onto the program. A letter came back from producers of the show saying that the case was too old to be featured on the show. Undeterred, nine months later, Marcana took a trip to a law enforcement conference in Wilmington, Delaware, where the executive producer of America's Most Wanted, Michael Linder, was going to speak. At the conference, Agent Marcana walked through the details of the case with Michael Linder, who, fascinated, agreed to produce an episode about the John List case. The FBI and officers began diligently supplying the show's team with all the information about the case that they could. However, they are missing a key asset the show relied on, a recent photograph. The most recent photographs of John List were 19 years old. Michael Linder decided to contact Frank Bender, an artist in Philadelphia who would frequently be contacted by police departments to sculpt busts of the faces of unidentifiable deceased bodies. For $1,500, Frank Bender was commissioned to create a bust of John List. Armed with a psychological profile of List, Bender delivered a 10-pound lifelike bust to the show's producer. If John List was alive, this is how Frank Bender thought that he would look. On Sunday, May 21st, 1989, the John List episode aired. Among the 22 million viewers watching across the country was Wanda Flannery. The former neighbor of the Clarks in Denver had known the truth for herself for almost a year now, and now, after seeing the bus made by Frank Bender, knew she had to inform the authorities about her former neighbor. She wrote down the number for the tip line and had her son-in-law Randy make the call, informing the tip line of Robert Clark's name and address. The next day, the tip was sent by mail along with 20 others to the FBI. The FBI diverted the tip to the Richmond, Virginia field office, which, after some checking of DMV records, determined that Robert Clark was a probable enough individual to check out. On June 1st, FBI agents stopped by the Clark's house. After knocking on the door and being informed by Dolores that Bob was at work, the FBI agents asked if they could come inside. They informed Dolores that they were there because of the program America's Most Wanted and showed her an FBI flyer with a picture of John List. Could this possibly be your husband, they asked. The color drained from Dolores' face. That looks like it could be my husband, but it can't be my husband. He's the nicest man in the world. Dolores started to cry. FBI agent August asked if there were any recent photos of her husband. She brought over their wedding photo. All doubts left the minds of the FBI agents. Agent August had his partner stay with Dolores as he made the drive to John's office and pulled in less than 30 minutes later. August, along with two other FBI agents, walked in. The secretary led them to Bob's desk, which laid empty. Worried, the agents rushed down the hallway and found Bob Clark walking from the Xerox machine. Flashing their badges, they asked Robert Clark to confirm his identification. What is your name? Robert Clark. Do you have a scar behind your left ear? Bob turned his head and showed his scar. Have you ever had an operation for a hernia? Yes. Were you born in Michigan? Yes. Are you an accountant? Yes. Are you John Emil List? No. I am Robert Clark. Then you wouldn't mind coming down to the police station for fingerprints. August held out handcuffs, and Bob, meekly, held out both of his hands. And just like that, Bob Clark was taken to the Richmond Police Headquarters where he was fingerprinted. It took a fingerprint expert a number of hours to make the comparison. When he was done, he walked out to the agents and gave them a thumbs up. After 18 years, the authority had finally made an arrest in the murders of Helen, Alma, Patricia, John, and Frederick List. Robert Clark was booked under the name John Emil List. Word of the arrest traveled fast, 
and by the afternoon, reporters were calling Dolores at home from comment. She arranged for a local lawyer, David Baugh, to represent her husband. In a written statement to the press, Dolores wrote, Please respect my right to privacy during this time. I am shocked to hear about Bob's arrest and what he is charged with. This is not the man I know. The man I know is kind, loving, a devoted husband and dear friend. He is a quiet yet friendly man who loves his work and the people he works with. He loves our new home and loves working in and out of it and around it. We both enjoy going to church. Bob is a man of devotion and faith. I find this hard to believe. I hope somehow that it is not true and that if it is, he was so stressed out that something snapped. I am devoted to him. I hope that somehow God will see us through this. Despite her pleas, Dolores would continue to be hounded by the press. At his next hearing, the defendant, still claiming to be Bob Clark, entered a plea of not guilty. His bond was set at $1 million. On November 10, 1989, John List was extradited to New Jersey, where he would reside at Union County Jail awaiting trial. On April 12, 1990, a Union County jury found John List guilty of four counts of murder in the first degree. Since there was no capital punishment statute in effect in New Jersey when the crimes were committed, John Meal List was spared the death sentence. On May 1, 1990, Superior Court Judge William L. Werthermeyer imposed the maximum sentence, five consecutive life terms, ensuring John List would never be eligible for parole. At sentencing, the judge said, The name of John Emil List will be internally synonymous with concepts of selfishness, horror, and evil. John Emil List is without remorse and without honor. After 18 years, 5 months, and 22 days, it is now time for the voices of Helen, Alma, Patricia, Frederick, and John Frederick to rise from the grave. John Emil List died in prison on March 21, 2008. It was Good Friday. <laughs>